Hi there, my name is Lyndon Jones. I'm a professor at the School of Optometry and Vision Science and Director of CORE at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. Let's start with some disclosures. CORE has received research funding and or honoraria from the following 21 companies and seven funding agencies. Okay, so let's begin by thinking about the impact of contact lens wear on contact lens comfort. Now we know that discomfort continues to be a challenge both for contact lens practitioners and patients and around about 50% of contact lens wearers complain of dryness and discomfort towards the end of the day to the extent that many of them actually end up dropping out. And when we look at contact lens dropout and we've had contact lens dropout surveys now for probably almost 30 years what we see is that continually around about somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of patients end up dropping out of lens wear primarily because of contact lens discomfort. So how can we impact that? How can we enhance and retain more patients from wearing lenses and stop them dropping out? Well, when we look at the impact of the contact lens on tear film stability, we know from Professor Craig's lecture that just the very presence of that lens has a significant impact on the breakup time or the rupture time of the tears. Now, in this study, what these researchers did was they took a bunch of wearers, 20 contact lens wearers, and first of all, they measured the breakup time over the cornea with no lens in place. And we can see that it was around about 21, 22 seconds. They then took those same lens wearers, got them to wear four different lens materials, and looked at what impact that had on breakup time. And we can see, first of all, that for all of them, it was significantly reduced. So the breakup time is around about five to six seconds. And secondly, very importantly, it really didn't matter what material it was. It didn't matter whether it was a hydrogel or a silicon hydrogel material, all of them had significantly faster rupture times. Now that was a relatively old study back from 2004. A more recent study by Michel Guillon looked at this in much more detail. And what Michel actually did was he looked at not only the breakup time, but the area of the tear film that was broken up. And so what we see here is on the vertical axis, we've got the exposed area, and along the horizontal, we've got the actual breakup time over the lens. So in this example of a patient, what we see is that the tear film remains pretty stable for around about, oh look, five to six seconds. And then as soon as it ruptured at, at 5.7 seconds, that breakup area significantly takes off, it really accelerates. So that when the surface breaks, it breaks and spreads really quickly. Now also interestingly is that Michel actually measured the interblink times. This is the time between the patient blinking and we can see that the patient actually blinks about after 10 seconds, but the surface is dry after 5.7. So for almost half the length of time that that patient's wearing the lens, the lens surface is drying up such that every single time the patient blinks, when their lid comes down, it's blinking over a dry surface. No wonder that lens is, uh, is uncomfortable. Now, the other interesting thing that Michel did was he actually looked at whether there was a difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic wearers, and he was able to show that there was a difference. So in the asymptomatic wearers, about six seconds, the symptomatic patients under five, and that was statistically significantly different. So quite clearly, break at time does have an impact on comfort. Now, another thing that we were interested in was what happens if you actually put a lens in, in terms of end of day comfort. And this is some work that we were involved in, where we took a bunch of contact lens wearers, we measured their comfort over the course of the day, morning till evening, when they wore spectacles. And then on four other days, they wore two different types of silicon hydrogels. And we looked at whether, first of all, there was a difference in comfort from morning to evening, and secondly, could we enhance or, or increase that end of day comfort by encouraging the patients to take a break from lens wear during the day? Now, what we're able to show is that in this far left hand column, this is the spectacle day. We can see that across the course of the day from morning to evening, there really wasn't any difference in comfort. So without a lens in place, pretty stable comfort over the course of the day. In the other four boxes, regardless of how long the patient took a break, every single time there was a significant reduction between morning comfort and end of day comfort. So quite clearly, the presence of the lens has an impact on comfort. Why is that? You know, basically when they're wearing their spectacles, they had no comfort across the course of the day. It's quite clearly relating to that interaction 
between the lens and the ocular surface. So how can we overcome that? How can we, what can we do to make the contact lens look and feel more like a cornea? And that's where this concept really of biomimicry comes in. Biomimicry is where we basically try to use nature um, such that when we have artificial materials, we make them feel like naturally occurring materials. And so if you think about what we're trying to do, we're basically trying to produce a contact lens surface that looks and feels more like the cornea. And so that's the concept around biomimetic or so-called bio-inspired materials. And that concept's really been you know, thought about for 10 years or so. So how can we do that? How can we make that contact lens surface more like the surface of the cornea? And I think we've really got two targets. The first of these is surface wettability. We've already seen that we definitely have a longer break at time over a cornea than we have over a contact lens. So we need to basically increase that. We need a longer pre-lens break at time and something that's much closer to what we see with the cornea. The second thing relates to the interaction of that lens with the tear film. When we think about what happens with the tear film over a natural cornea, basically we see this, this very complex tear film structuring very differently over the cornea than the way it structures over a contact lens material. You think about how that tear film structures over a cornea, you, you basically have a, a lower mucin-like area, then we've got a fairly thick aqueous mucin section and a layer of lipid over the top. We need to produce lens materials that encourage that kind of tear film structuring. So how can we do that? Well, when we think about this concept of biomimetic or bio-inspired contact lens materials, and we actually do a search on that, there's been just over 40 publications around that concept. Now, many of these actually are not really relevant to us because they describe drug releasing materials, but there are three commercial contact lens materials that have been developed and published on that try to use this concept. The first of these was back in the mid 1990s, a hydrogel material, omophilcon A, and then more recently two materials, hydrogel, nesophilcon A, and then the uh, more recent Delafilcon A material, a silicon hydrogel, hydrogel water gradient technology, which again, all of which is trying to mimic what we see in nature by encouraging basically a, a better in interaction, if you like, between the tear film and these materials. Now, interestingly, when we look at the publications on these materials, there's three common characteristics. First, anti-fouling. So they basically try to uh, resist too much deposition of the contact lens, uh, of the tear film rather, onto the lens surface. They all have low dehydration and they all exhibit enhanced wettability and lubricity. So low coefficient of friction and enhanced wettability to encourage basically when the lid comes down over the lens to not realize that that lens material is there. Now, more recently, what we see is some publications on a brand new material, a silicon hydrogel polymer containing MPC. And this MPC polymer surface really attempts to mimic the surface of the cornea. It comes from an area of trying to basically look at the interaction of these MPC polymers with blood contacting devices. So that's the history of where it's come from. Now, that's basically for things placed into your body. What about a contact lens? What would it look like if you take this MPC polymer and fabricate a contact lens from it? Well, in these two very recent publications, and these two publications have actually come out this year, what we see is that the, this MPC polymer surface material demonstrated really quite a different performance compared with other contact lens materials. It showed reduced lipid and protein deposition, reduced adhesion of fibroblasts and bacterial cells, and a very, very low frictional force, again, to uh, basically encourage this sliding of the lid over the surface of the lens. It's a very soft surface, so when you look at how compressible it is, it has really a very compressible surface. When you look at wettability measured in the laboratory by measuring contact angle, it has a very low contact angle which would suggest that it would be relatively comfortable in eye. And when we look at the surface topography by a thing called atomic force microscopy, what we see is that that surface is really very, very different to what we see in conventional silicon hydrogels. 
So people are definitely starting to look at this concept of biomimicry and try to produce materials that really behave and look and feel much more like the cornea. In summary, we know when it relates to contact lens comfort is that we simply have to increase contact lens retention. And the way that we can do that, of course, is by increasing contact lens comfort. How can we do that? Well, we need to develop new generation contact lens materials that behave much more like the way that the tear film interfaces with the cornea. And we're now starting to understand that and develop these new materials. When it comes to the data that we need, we certainly do need new studies and we need to really get a better understanding of their performance. We need to develop better in vitro methods to determine the interaction of these new materials with the ocular surface. And in particular, we need a better understanding of how those tear film components, in particular proteins and lipids, can remain in their natural active state when they interface with the, uh, the contact lens material and not discourage them, but actually encourage the interaction of appropriate tear film components. And with that, I'll say thanks very much for listening. Cheers.